Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to all of you joining us from different parts of the world. Welcome to the webinar on how to publish your first or next book in humanities and social sciences, brought to you by Euraxis Australia and New Zealand in collaboration with Taylor and Francis. Please allow me to introduce to you our esteemed guest speaker for today. We have with us Vilia Stephens, who is an editor at Rulis. She commissions books in all areas of education and behavioral science. Lucy is a senior editor at Rulis, also an imprint of Taylor and Francis. And Lucy commissions across a wide range of subject areas in humanities and media. And I'm Nishan Sandilia, regional coordinator for Euraxis Australia and New Zealand. For those who have joined our webinar for the first time, Euraxis is an initiative of the European Commission that addresses barriers to the mobility of researchers and seeks to enhance scientific collaboration between Europe and rest of the world. So we provide free information about European research, career opportunities, international collaboration, and networking possibilities. Since all of you are watching this on your laptop or phone, I'll encourage you to type your access Australia and New Zealand on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube and follow us there. I'd also encourage all of you to please use the Q&A function and not the chat function in the interface to ask any question that you might have while our speakers are presenting. Once the presentation is done, we will come back to take your questions. Please note that the recording and slide of the session will be provided to you. However, the recording will not include the Q&A, and hence I will recommend you to stay for the entire duration if you want our experts to address the common queries that generally the registrants have. Perfect. So let's begin now. Introduction, Nishant. Um, so, as you've already heard, um, Vilia and I are going to be presenting today. We're both commissioning editors for Routledge, which is a division of the Taylor and Francis Group. Um, my subject areas are humanities and media arts, and Vilia's are education and behavioral sciences. But we also work with a really enormous international team of commissioning editors who we are in close contact with on a regular basis. So if you have a proposal idea that's outside of our particular um, areas of focus, then please do feel free to get in touch with us and we can put you in touch with um, the right editor for you. Um, because yeah, our, our remit as a company stretches far beyond these subject areas that we focus on. Um, so to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about, about today and um, we'll start off with giving you a basic introduction to what kind of publisher we are and then we'll dive into the proposal process how to start thinking about proposal how to put one together um, and what happens once you've submitted it um, and then we'll give you an overview of the publishing process as a whole we'll talk about some initiatives like open access and then we'll talk about how to maximize your research impact once you've published your book um, and then we'll go into the Q&A. We're working on the assumption, uh, we're working on the understanding that most of you haven't published a book before. So this is a really basic kind of nuts and bolts overview of um, the publishing process. If there are some of you um, watching who have already published a book and have some more complex questions that we haven't covered here, then um, please do send them in um, in the Q&A session because um, we're very happy to get into more detail than what we cover here. Um, so who are we? We were founded by George Routledge in 1836. Um, as a publisher, we have a really, really broad range of subject areas that we publish in, but humanities and social sciences are our core focus and always have been. Um, we publish an enormous number of books over 5,000 new books every year in a really wide range of formats and series. Um, and I often say to potential authors that we publish in pretty much any format that you might want to publish in if you're an academic, which I think um, makes us stand out um, in relation to some other academic publishers because we can publish from textbooks through to research books. And we really do truly focus on, on both. Um, both formats, whereas some, some academic publishers have, have strengths in either textbooks or, or research books. Uh, we also publish a, a large number of journals, over 2,600, and we have a big um, local journals team in our Australian office. Um, 
we have global sales and marketing teams scattered across the world and then we have a large editorial team in the UK, the US, and then um, a growing editorial team in Asia and Australia. So where to start? If you know that you want to write a book or think that you might want to, um, we have some tips about how to start shaping your idea if you don't know how to, how to go about it. Um, the first three questions on this slide, um, what is your book about? Who is your book for? And why does the audience need it or want it? Are the best places to start. Um, the majority of people who send us proposals have focused a lot on the first question, the what the book is about, because that's the most obvious one. Um, and of course, you, you don't really have a book if you don't know what it's about. But the second two questions, the who and the why, are the really crucial ones that we often will go back to authors and ask for more information about. Um, you really need to have a really clear sense of a, a reader. You really need to have a really clear idea of who your reader is. Um, they could be people from kind of different walks of life and different kind of categories of reader, but um, you really need to have, an, have a reader in mind when you're writing it. And why do they need it or want it? Why does it need to be a book? Um, why would an audience want, why would your potential audience want to access it in that particular format? And what is it going to do that other books or other kind of forms of content aren't already doing for them? Um, what will it do better than the competition? Um, we like to know that you have a sense of what books in your field are already out there and why someone might opt to buy your book or read your book online instead of going to what's already available. Um, once you've honed your idea, um, which you can do in discussion with a commissioning editor, you don't necessarily need to have worked all those questions out before you come to us and start a conversation. But once you've started thinking about these questions, then it's great to discuss your book idea with colleagues, with authors who have published in the field, and with series editors, um, ideally before you approach a commissioning editor, um, because you will find that your colleagues and people who've published in the area will have a will often have a lot a lot of kind of valuable input um, and be a really good kind of um, really good people to bounce ideas around with. Um, so once you've had a think about um, what it is you want to do with your book, you can start to think about the different formats that you can um, publish through an academic publisher. So we publish a really broad range of research books that are targeted primarily at other researchers and students who are working within the university setting. Uh, our most common, commonly kind of um, known and understood format is the monographs and the edited collections. These are your kind of classic research books. Um, they're between 50 and 100,000 words and um, they're research driven and they're often written with researchers in mind. We have a relatively new format um, called Routledge Focus, which are shorter research books that are between 20 and 50,000 words. And these books uh, came about because there was this general feeling that there was a gap in the market for a book that kind of um, reflected research that was too meaty for a journal article, but maybe not quite um, big enough for a full length book. Um, so these short form focus books are really, really popular and a lot of academic publishers have an equivalent to a focus. Um, so it's becoming an increasingly kind of standard format um, and increasingly better kind of understood. They're really popular for amongst both authors and readers. Um, I think the, uh, uh, they were initially conceived as um, books that should be readable in one sitting. Um, and I remember one of the editors who was involved in kind of one of these first kind of um, one of these first short form publications saying to me that they felt that it should be um, readable. You should be able to board a flight and have finished the book by the time you arrive at your destination, which seems like such a crazy idea now that none of us, none of us are flying um, or not very few of us are flying. But um, 
yeah they're they're quite a fun relatively new format and then finally we've got our handbooks which are really big research work that intend to give you a thorough snapshot of a particular field at the time of publication um, they often involve an enormous number of contributors often um, a really international spread of academics who are involved in them um, and they're really really popular um, the usage of, of handbooks is, is really, really strong. So we're always very excited to hear about any ha new handbooks, like handbook ideas that authors might have. We also publish a lot of textbooks and professional books that are often written by academics um, and research, grounded in research, but um, the sort of outcome of that research is distilled um, in a really kind of accessible way for students or for practitioners. Um, so we've got a couple of examples of um, really successful textbooks that we've published for students. And then we've also got an example here of a, a professional book, the middle one, The Journalist's Guide to Media Law, which is um, a really, really successful book that is bought by a lot of journalists who are completely outside of the um, academic space. Um, so I think the te textbooks are pretty self-explanatory and you'll all be very familiar with what those are, but our professional books are sometimes a little bit, um, people don't really understand um, what they are, but they're, you know, an example would be this book that's for a journalist. We also publish a lot of um, books on our psychology and mental health list for psychotherapists. Um, on Villiers education list, there are a lot of books that are bought in high numbers by teachers. Um, so there are a lot of professionals out there who benefit from the books that we that we publish. We also publish an enormous number of book series um, and people don't always think of series when they propose books to us, but a lot of our books do end up in series and they're a really fantastic way to publish your work. Um, they're really good for us from a commissioning perspective and a marketing perspective because they're, they're a good way for us to demonstrate our particular interest in uh, a field and to demonstrate our commissioning focus. Um, our marketing team love them because they're a really good way to, to promote, um, promote our areas of focus. Um, but they're also really good for, for you as authors and particularly new authors. Um, they can be a good networking tool because if you publish in a series, you're immediately kind of becoming part of the series family. Um, you're working often quite closely with the series editor um, who will have input on your book in a similar way to a peer reviewer, but um, often with much more investment in, in your project than a peer reviewer would have. Um, and they're often... Um, a really good way to because a lot of our series will have an international spread of contributors there they can be quite a good way to to sort of join in on what becomes an international conversation um i think we've said here that you can use series to identify the right publisher for your book so if you go onto a publisher's website and have a look they'll have a section that lists their book series um, if you go into your subject area, you can often get quite a good idea of whether they are publishing in your area um, and based on whether they've got a series that might be relevant to your book. Um, and if they don't have a series that might be relevant to your book and you think that there's a gap for one, then by all means, tell the publisher. We're all, we always love to hear about new series ideas. Um, uh, and yeah it's just it's just something to consider we've got a couple of examples here of um we publish research series we publish textbook series and we also publish um series that are aimed at, at professionals so we've got really really broad range of them so we'll dive into how to write a proposal which really forms the meatiest part of our um presentation and probably what you're all here for in the main. Um, so your proposal is your chance to really sell your idea. So make sure it clearly says what the book will be about, who you're writing it for, what will be in your book and what it will offers, offer that others do not. 
And um, you'd be amazed the number of proposals we get that don't actually really give us this information. Um, so if you're writing, um, every proposal will have a section that asks you for a kind of general overview of your book. And if you're writing that, then it's, I would recommend that you use these questions as a bit of a framework for that blurb. Um, because these are the key questions that we want to try and understand when we're reading your proposal and they're kind of the framework from, from, through which we understand um, start to think about what format we might publish your book in um, and how we might shape it with you. Um, so they're, they're very good ones to have at the front of your mind as you're embarking on a proposal. So what's in a proposal? Um, I imagine that quite a few of you have already seen a proposal form, um, but if you haven't, um, this list is um, a pretty standard um, list for a lot of publishers to have on their proposal form. Um, publishers proposal forms don't vary all that much. <laughs> um, so if you're putting together a proposal for one publisher and it doesn't go through with that publisher, you haven't wasted time. If you want to then go and take it to another publisher, you can often kind of, you know, slightly re-angle your, your material for a new proposal, but you won't generally have to rework all that much content. And um, so they'll ask you for a provisional title and subtitle. And um, these, the, the emphasis on this is provisional. And um, a lot of authors put an awful lot of um, thought into their title and subtitle at proposal stage only to have it completely change throughout the peer review and publication process. So I wouldn't worry too much about this at this stage because um, we tend to have quite a lot of input on titles and subtitles. So just think about the most obvious possible title that your book could have and opt for that unless you have a really clear idea about what you want um, because that's something that we will work on with you. Um, we want information about the authors or editors. Um, what are you doing professionally at the moment? Have you published in the past? Um, are you involved in any um, associations or societies that we might be interested in? Um, a brief synopsis, which um, is what I was referring to previously when I said those four questions are good things to think about when you're writing the synopsis. And then a detailed table of contents. We're often asked, um, for edited collections, how detailed this table of contents needs to be, um, because often you know it can be hard to secure contributors and and get um, chapter abstracts if you haven't already secured a contract for the book. So I'd say um, different editors have different views on this. So if you're wondering, always contact the editor that you are thinking of submitting the proposal to. Um, and they'll be able to tell you how much information they would like. Um, information on readership and market. As I mentioned on a previous slide, this is really key and we really like authors to have given this a lot of thought about the potential readership before they put a proposal together. Um, and market, it's helpful for us to know if you're writing a textbook or if you're writing a research book that you think might have um, relevance to sort of upper level undergraduate courses or postgraduate courses, then it's helpful for us to know that because it plays into our, um, our decision making around the format that we might publish your book in. Um, we, there's always a section on competition. I would say that you can consider comp, com, books that might compete with your book, but it's also helpful to, for us to get a sense of um, books that you see as um, complementary to your book. Um, we're really trying to get a sense, not necessarily of whether there are any competitors to your book, but whether we'd like to get a sense of how you see your book fitting within the broader um, field. Who, whose ideas are, is it going to build on? Whose ideas is it going to be in conversation with? Um, we also asked for information on the size and likely format of your book. So here it's helpful to know roughly how long you think the book needs to be. And also if you have any particular thoughts on what kind of format you want to publish in. For example, if you think um, a paperback would be really important for student use, um, that's helpful for us to know from the outset. We ask um, you to say, tell us 
um, how long you think it will take you to write the book. Generally, um, people say it will take them roughly between a year and 18 months. And I generally, I personally generally say to authors, it's best to write a proposal when you think you could deliver the book within the next two years. And um, my reasons for that is are that um, often if, if the timeline is longer than that, the book can become a low priority and, and never really be prioritized and the whole process can become really protracted. Um, uh, but also we want the peer review to be rel relatively up to date um, because obviously in a lot of fields, things move quickly. And if something's peer reviewed four years before it is published, then um, that can sometimes be a little bit too long and we've, we've missed our opportunity um, to publish at the right time. And then finally, a sample chapter. Um, most um, publishers' websites will say that they require a sample chapter with um, the proposal, but it's not always a firm requirement um, for editors. So again, if you don't have a sample chapter ready, I would recommend contacting the editor that you want to submit your proposal to and just double checking whether they actually need a sample chapter or whether they're happy to proceed with just the proposal. So what something we're often asked is, what are you looking for? Um, and it's, it's often hard, hard to summarize that, but we've tried to do that on this slide. Um, more often than not, we're looking for a defined market, um, by which we mean a clear idea of who the reader is and a clear sense of um, whether that reader is actually going to, to want to, to buy or download the book. Um, we're looking for... Um, either regional relevance and or international appeal, by which we mean um, books that are really relevant to a particular regional issue can do really, really well, um, particularly student facing books. Vilya and I publish, commission and publish a lot of um, textbooks that um, are almost solely intended to cater for an Australian or New Zealand market. Um, but also with our research books, we're also really keen that they, we're often very keen that they have international appeal because we are, at the end of the day, an international publisher. Um, uh, so for research books, international appeal can be more important, but isn't always crucial. So again, this is something that is worth, if you have a book that has a particular regional focus, it's always worth checking with the publisher that you want to publish with asking the editor whether um, that regional focus will be suitable for their list because you will get, you will often get quite different answers from different editors. Um, we're looking for academic credibility, of course. Um, we're looking for originality and sales potential is, you know, a, a very important, a very important aspect of a book proposal for us as a commercial publisher. Um, but that's not necessarily something that we want you to gauge. That's something that we will assess ourselves. So um, you don't need to worry so much about the kind of specifics of that. But if you do know, for example, if you're putting together a textbook proposal and you know that it is likely to be adopted on certain courses, then it's really helpful for us to know that and to know how many students are enrolled on those courses um, and to get a sense of, of the size of the market. So if you do have information like that, it's always helpful for, for you to share it with us, but we don't require you to have it. It's part of, part of our job to investigate that ourselves as well. Um, we like you to use clear language and structure, and we will, we will comment on those aspects of the proposal if we feel that there's room to um, work on those aspects. Um, and then we think about practical issues like costs, images, permissions that might be required for any third party material that you're including in, in the manuscript. And I'm going to hand over to Vilia here, who's going to um, present for the rest of the time. Thank you, Lucy. So um, <clears throat> moving, I guess, to some of the things we've already talked about, but from the perspective of, um, I guess, 
new authors who are looking for advice or kind of having these discussions about what is required so we've kind of told you from our perspective what we're looking for what a proposal requires but this is a little bit more about the rationale i guess so talking about the importance of the title and subtitle as lucy mentioned these aren't things that need to be set in stone at this early point but um it is important that you have a think about I think the way Lucy put it was really effective in terms of the most obvious title for your book. So we are really reliant on discoverability for our content to be found. Um, and I think we all know we rely on keyword searches to find anything that we're looking for, especially in the research space. So you almost want to be thinking about, um, you know, your, your ideal reader and what are they kind of entering into a search engine or a digital repository? What words are they using to find the content you're writing? And I guess you're imagining them looking for your book before they know it exists. So what are those keywords um, that they're looking for? And you want to capture them to make sure that your book can be discoverable. And also from a publisher's point of view, it tells us straight away what we're dealing with. Like um, if, if your title is clear and direct, it doesn't have to be finalized, but if it's really describing what's in the book, then we have a really good idea, a good sense of, you know, like it's suitable for my list and I am looking for something that's covering this. So yes, I'm going to read this proposal straight away. How long should my book be? This is something else that Lucy's talked about. This is usually determined by the kind of book that you're thinking of publishing. So if it is a handbook, it does need to reach that um, larger extent of about you know, two, I think about 280,000 um, words uh, for the focus books that has a very hard limit of 50,000 words. So you kind of want to be thinking uh, simultaneously about your content, but also the kind of book you're envisaging and work within those kinds of requirements. Why do you need to pinpoint a readership? I think Liz has explained this really well. We do really need to have a defined market. We um, do get a lot of proposals that uh, say, you know, everyone will be interested in this book, which is kind of a red flag for an editor, because we need to know that the book will be really valued by a particular market, whether that market's small or quite broad in general. Um, we can't try and be all things for all people. So being really clear, clear about who you're writing for will just make your book stronger, your voice will come through more convincingly. And I think secondary and tertiary audiences usually come on board when you've really kind of hit your key market, um, you know, right on the nose, as it were. Uh, does your book need to have an international focus? This is something else that Lucy discussed. It does depend on the research. And this is something we can, perhaps your commissioning editor that you're talking to will have ideas about giving you guidance on this. Sometimes if um, it's an area of research that, um, in my own experience, I may not be that familiar with, I might use that question as something to focus on in the peer review process. So I'll engage some local and some international um, reviewers to get um, a sense of, so how are these international reviewers um, responding to this regional focus? And that can give us a real idea of whether we need to bring more international focus into the book to meet a market need. Um, again, we've talked about the competing titles. Why do I need to include them? Um, I think some new authors can be a bit nervous about including related um, or competition titles because it makes them think that maybe it gives a sense that there's no room for their book, but there is always room for a new book if you're bringing something genuinely original to the field. Um, but nothing publishes in a vacuum, of course. So, you know, they may be related titles, they may be direct competitors, but you've identified this existing book that is kind of missing the mark at some point and your book is coming in to fill that gap. Your time frame, again, as Lucy's indicated, um, it does need to be uh, um, feasible, but also um, practical. So um, that's something I'll talk about a bit later when I go through the kind of publishing process. But I think indeed, we want to make sure that the book that we're signing will be current when it publishes. So perhaps if you're looking at a timeline that's beyond two years, um, you know, I've had conversations with authors before who really want to propose a book, but they've still got some research to kind of finish up. And I think that's what can really extend your timeline and then things can make, fall uh, down the list of priorities. So thinking about, um, am I ready to really put this together and move forward? Um, or do I need a bit more time to finish the research I'm doing so then I can propose a book with a time frame of kind of 12 to 18 months? Uh, do we need to 
provide a sample chapter, as Lucy indicated, that's a question we get a lot. It will depend on the editor. It will also depend on the kind of book. And I'm going to talk next a little bit about publishing from your PhD. So in an instance like publishing from your PhD, especially if you've not published a lot before, we generally will ask for a sample chapter because it gives us a sense of um, your writing style outside of a PhD or outside of a journal article. Um, in some cases, perhaps um, if the chapter outlines are detailed enough, that will give us enough of a sense um, of your writing style and how the book will be written. Um, and we can also often maybe ask for a smaller sample, you know, perhaps um, a section from an introduction or the opening section of a particular chapter, for example, in a, if it was a professional book that's uh, saying it will um, kind of outline a bit of a theory and then throughout the chapter will um, demonstrate how that can be applied in practice. So perhaps an example of how that theory will be dealt with to give us a sense that the book won't be too kind of heavily academic. It, it is presenting that theoretical discussion in a way that's very palatable to a professional audience. Uh, as an edited collection, again, this is a similar question that uh, Lucy said can come our way. And, and the reason why we kind of sit on the fence sometimes about this is you may not always need all of the abstracts and secured all of the authors, but um, often my preference is, um, unless perhaps there might be uh, more experienced editors that I've worked with before, um, I'd like, you know, perhaps about 75% of the authors to be, um, you know, more or less committed to the project and sharing a chapter abstract because it does not only gives a sense that there is, you know, a genuine project coming together, but it also gives the peer readers something to kind of make a decision and, and, and look at and and put make an assessment of otherwise um, you know often some reviews of less uh, less structured proposals can come back saying I really like this idea but I need to see more and that's almost a, a wasted opportunity at peer review when we could have provided those reviewers a bit more um, content to look at. Uh, publishing from your PhD, which um, is a topic I'm ass we're assuming based on um, what who we understand is here and hasn't published before is something that you're probably quite interested in. There are a few things to keep in mind when publishing from your PhD. One of them, one of the key things to think about is the fact that um, you should consider the book as a brand new project that's based on your PhD research as opposed to something that is adapted or a shortened version of your thesis. Another thing to um, think about is uh, who the role that your editor or publisher plays. So your PhD thesis is a very specific piece of writing that is written for a very specific audience, that being um, your supervisor, your examiner, that very specific research community. However, a publisher or editor is the audience for the proposal for the book based on your research as opposed to the audience for your thesis. So um, please don't send your entire thesis to an editor when you're looking to get your PhD published. Um, we simply um, don't have the time to read through the entire thing. And what we are looking for is actually something quite different to the PhD thesis itself. One of the key things that you will really have to change is uh, the research methodology and literature review section. So the met methodology might be um, reduced to quite a, a brief discussion of how the research was conducted. The literature review will kind of be there in a sense, but it, you, you want to have a more nuanced engagement with the literature throughout the work. You'll need to adapt the language and style. Lucy spoke about language and style earlier, and we want to make sure that we are speaking really clearly to the audience. So yes, if it's a research monograph, it's still, um, it's still a very academic language, but you don't want it to be too jargonistic. You really are expanding your audience when you're working on um, the proposal for a book, for a, for a monograph that is commercially viable as opposed to your thesis that will have a quite a small audience. Uh, you may consider adding additional case studies or comparative studies. Again, that's that question about read. Often a PhD thesis might be based on a very small piece of research that really does have international relevance. And so this might be your opportunity to bring in more case studies, um, whether international or comparative in nature, that help you to broaden the scope of your work and ensure that it's appealing more broadly. Coming back to the sample chapter, again, um, when someone's proposing work from their PhD, a sample chapter is really useful or an extended sample of writing just to demonstrate that you have done the work in terms of looking at your thesis, thinking about the research that you did and showing that you're ready to take the next step and um, produce a book. Oftentimes, um, 
people who are proposing to publish from their PhD have published several journal articles and it is fine for those articles to, to have been published and to pre-exist before you propose or start working on a book. Um, but again, you don't wanna be lifting things verbatim out of your thesis or out of your journal articles. This is a new, um, it's kind of that next step. You've done that original research um, and reported on that in your PhD or in those journal articles. And this is your next step to kind of consolidate and broaden your audience. So coming back to uh, tie up the proposal process. So we do a comprehensive peer review process of every proposal we receive. So initially you'll submit your proposal uh, to an editor and you may have some initial back and forth. Um, there might be comments on the proposal from the beginning or if the editor feels that you've really um, fulfilled all the requirements of the proposal form and we're ready to go out to peer review. We generally try to get you know at least three readers for a um, a project and it does depend on the scope so if we're proposing something quite big like a handbook we might get more readers because we need a broader audience um, and, and the example we gave earlier about that kind of regional versus international focus in that sense we may also engage more peer review readers to get a sense from multiple regions or markets on who's interested in this topic um, we will accept minor or major um, amendments and recommendations from the peer review process. So we may get glowing reviews and um, are happy to go back to the order, the author with those and then take our proposal forward to a publishing committee for final approval. There might be some recommendations for small changes to the work and generally that can be worked out with your editor, perhaps in writing through an email or a basic document um, to then be taken forward to the committee. If there are more comprehensive changes required, sometimes we might ask that an author goes back and revises their proposal before sending it out for another round of peer review, just to ensure that um, that comprehensive feedback has been taken on board. And especially if it is kind of asking for a more broad change, like bringing in a whole new concept that need, that would help to broaden the scope of the project or equally removing something or in proposing something as a particular kind of work when the desired audience is actually saying, you know, this is great, but we actually want a new practical book in this department, or we actually need the research before we need the practical guidance. So that discussion happens with the author um, and wh whatever path we're taking, uh, once we're really happy with the reviews and with the state of the proposal, we go forward to the publishing committee. So it's worth keeping in mind that an editor will work with you to get um, to, before making a decision whether to accept or reject a proposal, we will work with the author to ensure that we've given every possible chance to um, get the proposal ready to present to the board. We would very rarely present anything to the publishing board without a sense that um, it's going to have quite a good chance of being accepted. We want to make sure that um, we've really assessed the peer review, we've given the author an opportunity to respond and that we are presenting something that is, you know, not just half-baked, but completely cooked um, to come forward and be considered by the committee. And if we do get that um, positive feedback from the committee and that green light, we can move forward to discussing a contract. Uh, and generally this whole process can take from about eight to 12 weeks. Some cases it can be a bit longer if there is a bit more back and forth and work required after that first round of peer review. Um, but generally uh, we're probably looking closer to that kind of um, eight to 12 week period of time. Um, often we can get things out to review really quickly, but um, as we all know, everyone's got very conflicting schedules and priorities, so it can often depend on the availability of reviewers and the other commitments that they've got. I'm sure everyone's being asked to review proposals and journal articles constantly, so we just have to keep that in mind that our um, readers may not always be as available as we would like. And once you move on to getting a contract, um, I'll give, we're going to just give a very quick whistle stop tour of the actual publishing process and timeline because we are focusing more on that kind of early proposal stage. So that proposal peer review and assessment stage that we just talked about, um, I've given, a, we've got a very broad timeline here of two to six months. So two is that kind of eight week period where we move through peer review quite quickly and there's lots of support for the project. We feel confident in taking it to the board quite quickly. Um, when we're looking at something like six months, which is unusual usually long, but it's worth kind of indicating that where there is a little bit more work, so perhaps we get some supportive, but, um, you know, constructively critical reviews that ask for a lot 
a lot of change. So that might be the case in which we're asking an author to revise the whole proposal, not just kind of tweak something here or there or kind of commit to a small change. Um, and then we'll send that out to review. So that's adding, an, you know, depending on the author's availability to make the changes and then sending that back out to peer review. It is definitely something we don't like to blow out to that timeline, but it's just, to, I guess it's worth noting that we, we can workshop for, you know, longer than one round of peer review to really get a sense of how your book could work. Once signed um, a contract, we, uh, we've talked about timeline, so we can go up to about two years and three months is a very brief timeline, but that um, would apply in a case where an author has come with a more or less complete manuscript. And I don't mean a complete PhD thesis, I do mean a genuinely complete book manuscript that um, they're going to take a bit more time to kind of think about. They've got the peer reviews from the proposal, perhaps we've sent an extract from the manuscript out to review as well, taking in that feedback. Of course, there are lots of requirements we have for publication, so making sure copyright permissions are resolved, that um, you've sourced um, the appropriate quality of images, um, and there's just some general formatting and things that need to be taken care of. And I think we know that when we're kind of stepping away from a, a big piece of work and coming back to it, we always find things we want to change. So even if a manuscript script is complete we do like to allow like a, approximately a three month timeline just to allow that author to go back revise make sure they're happy with their work and not just kind of commit to submitting something the day after they've signed their contract unless they are really really keen to do so uh, we move then once the book is submitted to your editorial uh, team there's you know some kind of broader um, checks that we do in terms of really making sure that the book you've submitted is what you committed to writing in the proposal um, and making sure all of those administrative things such as permissions, artwork, um, some particular paperwork that we require, um, alt text now that we want to make sure that um, the online reading experience is as accessible as possible. That's another requirement. Um, we then move into production. So our production team is, we have a really high production quality um, in all of our books, uh, we engage uh, freelance copy editors, typesetters and professional indexers to work on our books. And um, then we move on to the printing or digital publishing step, I suppose. So that whole process can take kind of four to six months. That shorter four month period applies to the focus book that Lucy mentioned earlier in the proposal, because it's a much shorter book generally. Um, very minimal artwork and can move through production quite quickly. Something more complicated and um, perhaps a, an art history book with lots of images or a textbook with lots of elements and questions and things can take a bit more time through the production process. And finally, we move to publication, which is the day that every author looks forward to when your book is available to the market, whether it be in print or in um, digital forms. It's worth mentioning that we publish all of our books in print and digital formats. Um, many of our research books only publish in hardback and digital on publication, and then we often release a paperback about 18 months later. Um, but everything, we often get the question, will my book be available as an ebook? And the answer is always yes. Uh, so moving on uh, from ebooks to open access, we do have an open access um, program. I might just get all of these icons up to talk about them. Um, so I'm assuming most people will be quite familiar with the concept of open access. Um, we have three main options, the gold, green and open plus books. For Gold OA, that's probably the most um, common uh, fee-based uh, approach to open access. That's in which the final, uh, you know, copy edited typeset published digital version of your book or chapter, you can nominate just to make chapters open access, uh, available freely for download from our website and other partners online. They're available permanently for free for anybody. Um, and while most commonly uh, will receive a proposal perhaps um, or a manuscript that where the authors found funding, I'll talk more about funding in a minute. Um, and we the, the charges are made kind of at manuscript submission stage that when the book publishes, it's made open access immediately. But there are options for um, making a, pro a book open access retrospectively. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We also have green open access. So uh, this is a situation in which an author can choose a chapter uh, to be made open access after an embargo period. So, um, and it's also not the final version of the chapter. It is the, um, so not the typeset copy edited version that will eventually be published. It is the, what we call the accepted manuscript. So that's the word file uh, that you submit to your editor. It might be myself, it might be Lucy, um, upon final submission of your manuscript. So that's the version of your chapter that you've said, okay, I'm happy with this. This is what I wanna put into production. After about an 18 month period from publication of the book, you are able to share a copy of that chapter on um, various online platforms. Uh, so it might be a personal website. Um, this applies to 
uh, uh, departmental repositories. Uh, it does also include the embargo period is quite important for websites like Academia um, and Research Gate. So there is there is that embargo period, but it is a if if funding is an issue, um, you know that is something you can consider in the future. But it is it's not sharing the final version. We also have a new publishing method uh, called Open Plus Books. So it's quite exciting in which there is it's also a fee based model, um, but the content can be published within days. We're kind of talking around fourteen days from submission. It's um, something we're doing in partnership with the F one thousand platform, and it's a really exciting new way of looking at kind of traditional book publishing and open access publishing and delivering that um, to the research community. So um, the thing to highlight, um, actually, I will go here, we're going to talk about funding, but I would just flag now that um, it's important to remember that all of our open access publishing goes through the same peer review process as our standard publishing. I'll talk about that in the next slide, but I just want to highlight that at this point, because we are talking about a fee based model. So uh, the funding for open access is generally paid by a research funder or institution. Um, you know, there's been examples of the money coming direct from a research grant or perhaps um, the university. Uh, with a gold open access book, you can nominate to make your whole book open access or a single chapter. And I've quoted our standard, we have standardized pricing in pounds and euros. I've included the euros because I know um, this is a community in which we might be looking for European based funding. Um, and I've done a kind of a, this is an approximate um, estimate of what the fee might be in Australian dollars based on the current exchange rate, but it is dependent on the exchange rate. So it's always important to kind of check in about those rates. Um, and I mentioned earlier, we can do retrospective OA. So it might be that you really want to make your book open access, but during the um, time of proposing your book or writing your book, you've just not come across the funds. Um, it might be several months after publication that you come across the funds to make your book available open access. And we actually have a tiered discount structure for this. So as you can see, between 12 to 24 months, there's a 30% discount. And as we move up towards 36 months and beyond, you can get up to a 70% discount off the open access fee. So that's quite, um, it's, it's quite a good option to consider you know perhaps you'll come across funding later on in the piece or um you know th that discount makes it more manageable for you with the funding you have access to coming back to the open plus books um, program this is a program that we have really just quite newly launched <clears throat> pardon me and the fee the fee structure is still being um worked out so this that I'm afraid I can't quote the prices to you, but as soon as they are available, they will be available on our website. So I encourage you to check in um, on the open access pages of our website, which we'll share links to. Um, it's really important to think about the increased impact you can uh, get with your open access publishing. So um, you know, a research project um, conducted in 2020 found that um, open access books are downloaded 10 times more um, and cited 2.5 times more than standard ebooks. And they're also discussed more um, widely on online platforms, um, social media, various online discussions. So it's a really great way to increase the impact of your work. You also uh, can get a much broader audience. So um, from the same study, these um, kind of heat maps demonstrate um, for a non-OA kind of download, uh, sorry, ebook, uh, the extent to which it's referred to across the globe. And then if you move over to the open access book, you can see that you get a much broader range of engagement um, across the globe with your research. Um, so when you're thinking about accessibility, um, often, um, you know, is it students, is it, um, uh, researchers and readers from countries where the, the funds aren't as available for to um, resource, you know, university institutions and libraries. This is a really great way to get your uh, research out into the broader community. I'll just go through these. So the key points about open access, again, your book or chapter can be read by anyone anywhere. It's downloadable um, from our website as a PDF and then other third parties Pardon me, my dog is barking in the background. I'm not sure if anyone can hear that. Um, your, yeah, it can be accessed anywhere. And so third-party platforms will have it available as a free ebook, um, for example, Amazon. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our OA books go through the same rigorous peer review process as our kind of standard publishing model. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, so you will still prepare a proposal. It will still go through that um, peer review um, process, uh, engaging with the feedback, whether we can move straight to a um, 
editorial board meeting or whether there's some more work to be done on the proposal before it goes forward. Um, and the reason for that is that we still have those quality checks and balances. So the open access fee is a way to make your work freely accessible, but we still have these checks and balances in place to make sure that we are publishing the most academically rigorous scholarship and, and you know, research-based professional resources that we can. Uh, the research funder is typically charged at manuscript submission. Um, obviously that's different if we are doing a retrospective at OA, um, but of course, if, if we are mid production and you find that you've come across funding, this is definitely something you can talk about. But if, if you are coming to us, for example, with a proposal um, for an OA book, um, generally the fee will be charged at submission. Um, although I have had experiences where research funding does need to be spent within a certain time frame, So if the, the invoice needs to be um, raised at a certain point, that's completely fine too. Um, and remembering that, uh, the discount which is available for um, up to 70% after 36 months of um, after publication. Maximizing research impact. So in line with um, open access, uh, some really great things you can do to maximize the impact of your research and how broadly disseminated it is. Posting updates on academic and professional networking sites is a really valuable way um, to engage directly with an interested audience. So these are people in your network, they're going to have common interests um, with what you're publishing. Using social media uh, to post links to your book page. Um, I think it's, especially if we're talking about open access, I had a book that published out of our local list last year um, and was actually named in the top 10 uh, most used open access books across TNF in 2021. And um, the lead author of that book was really proactive with social media. Um, she was posting uh, something every day about an individual chapter in the book after release. So she kind of went from the first to the last chapter highlighting the author's work, um, the key considerations. And uh, this was a book in education that's really managed to get um, beyond the research community and into um, the, I guess, the, the downloads of, of teachers. Um, you can add a summary and link to your department website. You can add your book to your students' reading lists. Speaking to your institution's press office is a really good place uh, to start as well. They can often give you a lot of support in terms of um, institutional supported um, social media coverage. Perhaps they can help you film a video. Um, they may be able to do a press release for you that could be working in conjunction with our own marketing. If you're a blogger or have a personal web page, you can write an article um, and link it to your book. Um, it's another way we talked about keywords. So I think anywhere that um, you're writing content that's related to your book um, and, and your title, uh, where people are searching for that content and they can find something engaging and brief like an article that you can share and then move on to the website to find your book. That's a really useful way to kind of encourage engagement with your work or sales. Um, recording a short video I mentioned you can usually get support from the institution from that uh, for that and it, or it's something you can really easily do quite well um, with a personal digital device and you can share that kind of thing on social media um, turn it into an interview format as well is a really nice and engaging way to discuss your content without feeling like you're kind of overloading people with information and something as simple as adding a link to your email signature is actually really effective. I mean, we're using email all the time every day and um, something that alerts people that you're in communication with to the fact that your book is now available is actually a really, really productive way of spreading the word. We also have a dedicated page on our website called Author Directions that has some really comprehensive guides on, um, you know, some of the things that we've talked about today. So navigating that journey from PhD to book, how to write a really successful book proposal, um, what you can do in the writing process, guidance on um, kind of how you can leverage your networks in terms of promotion of your work if you are successful in gaining a publishing contract. So there's a really, really great range of resources available on that website. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. I'll leave our um, contact information up there, but I'm sure it will also be shared. And, um, I think um, a lot of our audience will agree with that, that it has been a very insightful uh, one hour that we uh, got this information from both of you, Julia and Lucy. Uh, thank you very much for taking out time for your schedule and speaking to us about the nitty gritty. Um, it, it was really a pleasure. Um, to wrap up, please allow me to reiterate to keep uh, an eye on our social media platforms to get notified of such informative webinars in the future. 
with that, we come to an end of today's session and signing off for today and wishing you a good week ahead. Thank you very much for joining in uh, and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.